Welcome to Freedom's Journal Magazine TV. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace. Today our program gives you a black conservative perspective of current events. As Samuel E. Cornish and John B. Russworm, co-founders of the original Freedom's Journal said, and I quote, we wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. Too long has the public been deceived by misrepresentation of things which concern us dearly. These words hold as much truth today as they did when they were originally written. It is from this perspective we discuss the 2012 election, the economy, voter ID fraud, genocide in the black community, and a special segment with Armstrong Williams and his book on Reawakening Virtue. Our plate is full and our time is short, so let's get started. Welcome back. We're here in the studio with my good friends, Armstrong Williams, who has a syndicated TV show as well as a radio program and a syndicated columnist, and my good friend, uh, Raynard Jackson, who's the uh, CEO of Raynard Jackson Associates, who also does syndicated uh, has syndicated columns and writes for, both of them have columns that come out into Freedom Journal Magazine. Um, pleasure to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you. We want to talk about the uh, 2012 election. Uh, first of all, what do you think about the uh, uh, conventions? Well, it's sheer entertainment, theater, production. Um, if you believe the bounce in the polls, um, President Obama's convention had better theater because he had a past president who did a very good job of deceiving people even further. No different than some of the things that were said at the Republican convention. But the good thing about, uh, even though I know that the polls indicate that the president has gotten a bounce, I don't know about you, Raynor, but you know, when you're on radio, it's like a laboratory. I talk to so many people that feel that President Obama has not earned a return on their investment of four years ago. And as much as the polls may indicate otherwise that Obama is leading, especially in the battleground states like Ohio and Florida and other places, mm -hmm. I just got to tell you, we may have a Truman Dewey on our hand where America may be shocked in November. I just don't think Obama should take comfort in the fact, think, thinking that he has it in the bag. I think we have a long way to go, especially given what's happening with the Middle East, the fact that he should have never toppled a devil we knew in uh, Gaddafi with a devil that we're still getting to know. Um, we, it's worst off if we had never gone and backed the, the spring, Arab Spring in Egypt or backed the movement in Libya, we certainly would not have the case where we lost our ambassador. These are the kinds of things that you cannot predict because they take on a life of their own and we don't know how they're going to play out because we don't know where this is going. Yeah, um, I, I agree 100% with what Armstrong is saying and with the president and the Democrats having Hollywood in their back pocket, it stands to reason they probably will beat Republicans for the theatrics of a convention. Uh, the convention by the Democrats would just stagecraft beautifully because they had no substance to talk about. And so you had to mask the lack of substance with hieroglyphics and, and uh, uh, pomposity. And so the president is very beatable and vulnerable. What I think Romney needs to do a better job of is telling the American people why he's a better option than what we have now. because. To me, the president's very weak on domestic issues, and there was a big opening for Romney to exploit that. You know, I don't think that um, Romney is a better option. I don't believe that. I don't think Romney is a worse option. I think the worst option is what we have in the White House now. I don't think, I, I don't want the American people to get so caught up that they believe that if Romney were to win in November, all of a sudden we're going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Everything is resolved. That is not the case. America is in a financial crisis. America is bankrupt. It's going to take more than Romney and the Republicans who would have their hand in the responsibility for this crisis that we're in. They just keep spending money. These are drunken spenders. But the bottom line is that what Romney can do is not mess it up further. And what I'm praying for, like many Americans, because of his experience at Bank Capital, as a businessman and being physically conservatively sound, that he could manage this crisis better than President Obama. We just want a better manager. Not somebody that's gonna solve the problem because the economies are cyclical. You hardly have to leave the patient alone and allow the patient to heal itself. Well, let me ask you two questions. And one, one is, what is the strategy for, for Romney, for victory for Romney? I know your strategist, uh, Reynard, and I'm sure you are as well, uh, to, to win in, in November. And then secondly, you just talked about plan, uh, plan for the economy. Uh, uh, let, let's do a strategy to win, and then let's talk about the plan for the economy. Well, to win, to me, 
Romney should take advantage of his background at Bank Capital. He's a manager, he's a problem solver, he knows how to do a return on investment. So if the American people invest their vote and confidence in his election, what is it that Romney will do? He will give the American people a return of their investment. And what is that return on investment? In my view, it will be not making anything worse than it already is, number one. Uh, get spending under control number two, mm -hmm. and then clearly define what our foreign policy objectives are. But again, what Armstrong said, it was a very interesting point, the way you put it, that Romney cannot do any worse. I like that. You know, listen, here's what I don't understand, and, and I implore understanding on this, is that you would forget that Romney was a governor of Massachusetts. You would forget that he was the CEO of Bain Capital and that he managed the Olympics. I have never seen a candidate who is sometimes so inept in conveying his message. And you would think that he has no experience. Even in his responses, he says one thing, he takes it back. You don't really know what he believes. You know, my parents always told me, if you reach a certain age in life, if you have not found something that you're willing to die for, or something to win and lose an election over, you've not lived. He's got to get to the point where he says, forget this. I'm willing to lose the election over principle. I just think what he has to do is a very little. And in the debates, in the upcoming debates that we will see, I think Romney has a chance to just show leadership. Let people know what you believe. Don't just say you're going to create $12 million jobs. Tell us how you're going to create these jobs. Give us substance instead of worried about whether you're going to be criticized by what you believe in. Well, anyway, well that goes into plan. Uh, I read an article by Thomas Sowell who talked about um, uh, President um, Hardy, how he, didn't, um, how he didn't do anything. Actually, they had a... Um, uh, 11% unemployment, and he was, people were trying to get him to, uh, you know, do something. They're always, always trying to get the federal government to do something. His idea was that maybe you should do nothing and just let, it, let the uh, uh, economy uh, correct itself. What do you think? No, I agree. Matter of fact, it, uh, that's what Romney advocated for the auto bailout. And the media just twisted it and contorted it, and Romney didn't do a, a good job of explaining exactly what that position was because... If you had left the auto industry alone, those who were weak and, and, and non-responsive to the marketplace, guess what? They would have got, uh, went out of business. Mm -hmm. Those that would remain would have been more responsive to the marketplace. Right. So right. Romney did that, and then, like Marshall said, he backed away from it. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. I'm, we're running out of time, but I want you to answer this question. And actually, it was President Harding. Um, uh, what, does the, what does the GOP need to do to reach out to the African-American community we only have about 60 seconds to actually answer that question. I know you've been critical of, of Romney and not having enough African Americans on his staff and so forth. But what do we knew, need to do to get this back to being the party of Lincoln, if you will, where there were more blacks voting in the Republican Party? I think we need to answer that question differently. I think Romney and every Republican before him have reached out to the American black community. I think it's time for the American black community to reach back and really assess what they've really gotten from that democratic plantation and make a change to become a majority of both parties. So no matter who's in power, they are represented. I agree 100% with that. It has to be a, a two-way street. And as long as we are 96% in one party, there's no really need to battle for your vote. And Obama can continue to ignore the black community like he's done, which I, it just dumbfounds me how we can continue to vote for him when he's done nothing for us. Absolutely. So you would put some responsibility, just not on the Republican Party, but there are also some, some personal responsibility, like we talk about, for the African-American community to actually decide, hey, we're tired of being overlooked by one party, and we're tired of uh, the other party taking us for granted. Yeah. Well, That's true power. Right, right. Well, I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, my man. Thank you. In a moment, we'll be back. Welcome back to Freedom Journal TV. I'm your host, Eric Wallace, and we're here with my good friend, Armstrong Williams, who has just written a, a new book called Reawakening Virtues. Hello, Armstrong. Hello, Eric. Dr. Wallace, my apologies. <laughs> That's fine. You've known me a long time, even before I was Dr. Wallace. Yes. So um, tell me a little bit about Reawakening Virtues. What made you decide to write a book about virtue, especially since you've been involved in the political realm? Isn't it kind of void of virtue? You know, um, I, I've been blessed to, to write books, and I like writing books where I criticize Democrats and the so-called liberals. But then I realized that, you know, there is something that we all um, 
can agree upon. And, and you know, when I went through No Child Left Behind, and I had to go to, I didn't go all the way to the valley, but I could smell it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, God had to work on me. You know, sometimes in life we can be manipulative, we can tell white lies, we can deceive, we can lose our anchor, we can lose our cornerstone. And so instead of my focusing on blaming somebody about no child left behind, the spirit within me forced me to look at myself. And I've always railed against people, whether it's same-sex marriages, whether it's lifestyles, whether it's out of wedlock births, and, and then you realize I had my own issues that I left unattended to. And then I realized in life that the hardest work we all do, 24 hours a day, the toughest work is working on ourselves. And so I had to do a special inventory and a special assessment of myself, and I realized that I was not good as much as I used to be. And I needed to get back to what made me good, what made me a human being, what made me wholesome. And I got back to um, spirituality. And I'm not talking about in terms of religious religiosity. I got back to going to church. I got back mm -hmm. to reading the Bible. Not just reading it, but putting those words in actions. Because so often when we face a storm in life, because in life, you're either coming out of a storm, going into a storm, or you're in the storm of life. Right. And we like to reflect on others so we don't have to focus on ourselves. But I took a look at myself, and I realized I could do things better. So I went, got back to hard work, honesty, integrity. Let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. And then also, finding the good in people that I vehemently disagree with. Because God created us all, and God made no mistake, and so there's good in everybody. And if you find the humanity in people, and you encourage the good in people. I got back to saying, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, good morning. I got back to paying my 10% tithes on Sunday, and all of a sudden, I woke up one morning, almost four, and I was in that valley for a minute, almost five years later, and the sun came out. It was a different kind of sun. I felt a brightness mm -hmm. come over my spirit, and I could just feel that I was gonna be okay. I felt that my time near that valley was over, and all of a sudden, Amen. my life just changed. And for the last three years, it just keeps getting better and better, and I'm so grateful. So I wanted to write about reclaiming those virtues, reawakening, because they're in you, but you've got to reawaken them so you can find the good in you and, and, and embrace the good, and so let people see the good, not through your rhetoric, but through the way you live, and then they'll begin to be good again. So what should people take away as they, were, as they read your book um, from this? What do you want them to take away? As you wrote it, I'm sure you had people in mind as you know, what they would take away from this. Well, you know what, Republicans have no monopoly on morality and virtues. You know, and oftentimes we set ourselves up as some um, paragon of virtues and all righteousness, and then we begin to see the flaws, and then people begin to believe less in the message and think we're hypocrites. And what people have to forget, remember is that there's a failure in all mankind. Just because you, as a minister, preach God on Sunday, and you commit an awful sin on Monday, doesn't change the word and the truth that you spoke in that pulpit. There are no perfect people, there are imperfect people, and you can tell the truth even if you don't live the truth. And you've got to separate the struggle mm -hmm. and the stumble of man from the fact that the truth never changes. And so we all want this, these perfect people, but we have to realize that we've got to get back to truth. And the truth doesn't come from politicians. In my opinion, they all tell white lies. They say what we need to say. It's all theater. They come to Washington, they get rich, and yet people suffer and suffer and suffer. And if people really want to change their lives, they've got to realize that the best and the worst thing that happens to them is because of them. And they've got to get back to the values of hard work, discipline, mm -hmm. self-worth, and pass those on to their children. Would you agree with the statement that, uh, that everyone, anybody who's going to do anything, worth anything, has to go through some kind of hard time? It's kind of a molding or a shaping of your character, if you will. And that the time that you'd write about in the book that helps, helped mold and shape you was possible for you now to go further and to do even more than you ever thought, you know. You know, I, you know, I am so grateful for the obstacles and the challenges and the mm -hmm. suffering of life. Because you know what I realized it was, and I coined this, I call it spiritual weightlifting. You have to lift those spiritual weights because you don't really appreciate God. You don't realize how much you need God. And you don't really appreciate the good that you can do and how soon you can forget the good once you come out of that valley. And so it's how you look at that struggle, how you build from that struggle. Because there's no struggle that's so great that you cannot overcome. If you're willing to do what Michael Jackson once said, just take a look in that small mirror 
and start making not a drastic change, but gradual change every day because you can't do it overnight. It's hard to break bad habits that have become routine. But a little effort every day. You don't use profanity today. You're not trying to bang every woman you see the next night. You're not out here telling white lies. You keep restraining yourself. And you keep restraining yourself. Well, you know what? I'm going to go. You got your Ramadan. I got my Christian, uh, my period between the, with the resurrection where we go through and we sacrifice something. I don't just wait for that period. I'm always trying to sacrifice something. Sacrifice a, a lesser good for a greater good in the end. Well, Armstrong Williams, I appreciate your writing this book. I love the book. Started reading uh, Reawakening of Virtues. I think it's a great book. It starts the conversation of us getting back and looking at virtues. For me as an ordained minister, and as, as you know, a PhD in biblical study, for me, I'd like to see a little bit more scripture in it, but that's, that's me. I'm a, I'm a biblical <laughs> scholar. I'm a preacher as well. <laughs> but, but, I'm I, not. <laughs> but I appreciate what you did, and it starts a conversation, a conversation I think we need to have. So those of you who have not had a chance to read this book, you should get it and read it. You'll be blessed by it, and it'll start a new conversation for us. I appreciate your being here. Thank you, brother. And we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Freedom's Journal Magazine TV. This segment, we're going to be talking about the state of the economy. With 14% unemployment in the African American community and 8% unemployment or 8.1% unemployment in general, the question is what can the government do to change this? And today we have with us Cedric Mohammed, who is a political strategist and business economist. We also have my good friend Bernard Jackson, who is the CEO of Bernard Jackson and Associates, who's also a syndicated columnist and uh, where your column uh, shows up in The Root, as well as Black Enterprise. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Pleasure, Dr. Wallace. So answer that question. Tell, tell, tell all those people out there wondering, what can the federal government do to help turn things around? Well, it's limited, but government has a place. It can lay the pillars of a commercial society which revolve around three things. It can provide risk-free assets. It can provide the rule of law, judiciary. And it can govern, through regulation, the exits and the entry points of business activity, trade and commerce. So that environment, if you assume government does that properly, it allows entrepreneurs to enter into contracts, debtors and creditors to borrow and loan money from each other, and for individuals to engage in commerce knowing that no fiscal policy, no trade or regulatory policy will be disruptive to the basics of economic activity. So it means the government acts more like a referee? Yeah, or a way? field. On a, imagine a, a football game where the field has no bumps in it, where the, the yards and the meters and the feet are measured properly, that's mm -hmm. all really that government can do. It can lay out the rules and a level playing field. Okay. Yeah, what's well, interesting, you go back to the 80s and early 90s, in the auto industry, China, I mean Japan, was just devastating our auto industry. Why? Because they made better product, number one. The American people were saying we wanted smaller cars because of the high price of gas. Detroit said, no, 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 we're going to make the big gas cars. Guess what? The American people started buying all the Japanese and the South Korean cars, and the auto industry went through a depression mm -hmm. and almost went out of business because they did not respond to the marketplace. And so what the government has to do is more psychological than, than, than uh, physical. They have to create an environment where the markets have confidence. For example, we had, corporate America right now has over $3 trillion, with a T, dollars sitting offshores because they don't know what the tax policy is going to be over the next 12 uh, to 24 months. They don't know who's going to be in the White House. And so corporate America is, is banking their money overseas. Can you imagine if the economy had got an infusion of $3 trillion, what that would do for the unemployment rate and for job creation? So that's the role of government is to create a psychological confidence that it's okay to do business in the U.S. So what is the problem right now that the economy is stagnant? And, and, and some of you are going to say we may be enter, entering into another recession. What is it that the administration is doing or not doing um, that is causing this to happen? Well, the, the bottom line problem that no political party is admitting is that there's structural unemployment. You have a skills mismatch where the educational system is not prepared individuals to work and the shifting economy from manufacturing to service to information mm -hmm. has not allowed uh, those with the proper skills to gain employment and no government training program has provided something that can stand in the gap. So that's the first... Uh, Are you saying there should be a government training program? Government training uh, has, a, for instance, the Department of Labor each year projects what fields 
uh, will have certain jobs and occupations filled for the next 10 years. Okay, it, it's, a, it's a projection that very few people pay attention to. Most of the careers in the next 10 years will be in the healthcare profession. That's really the secret behind why all this attention to Obamacare and healthcare. It's because the government and most economists know that's where the growth will be. I believe that the problem is that government needs to be clear and politicians need to say that, look, at the end of the day, financial literacy and understanding what you can do with income and what you can do with wealth are two different things. And then to l uh, lower taxes or eliminate them on capital gains, dividends, interest, income, and then it let individuals save their earnings and build that into capital through those types of policies is how we will allow people to actually build wealth under any environment, no matter what the emphasis is, manufacturing skill, services or information. Yeah, but see, the other problem is people keep saying recession. I have a degree in the tax and counting from Oral Roberts University, mind you. Okay. But the classical definition of a recession is four consecutive quarters of negative growth in the GDP. We're in a depression even though everyone's talking about classical definition of recession, this is a depression, not only structurally, but I think psychologically more so than structurally. And part of that problem is the massive amount of debt the U.S. government had, or the um, America had, because when the, the government is borrowing almost 90 percent of its funds to fund the government, guess what? That takes away money that the private sector can use to borrow. And if the private sector can't borrow, domestically and they have to go overseas, they have to pay a higher interest rate and no company's going to do that. So it's a spiral effect. That's number one. Number two, this notion of cutting defense spending, are you crazy? That's where most of your R&D comes from, basic and applied research. Right. And as a result of those programs, you got the VCR, you got the microwave oven, you got cell phone technology. That all came out of the Department of Defense and NASA. So if you cut all these research programs and funding for DOD, then you cut into your future uh, 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 exploring future technologies. Well, you mentioned that uh, having so much debt is, is a real drag on the economy. How do we, how do we fix that? You, hear, you know, Barack Obama obviously wants to raise, raise taxes on those making 250000 or more. Um, you have the Republicans saying, no, we don't want to raise taxes. You know, what, what is the truth? What, what is it that we need to well, be doing here? Well, the, we only have about two minutes. Well, the problem is not debt. It's whether the debt is manageable. America's problem is that its debt to GDP ratio has passed 90%. And historically, once you cross the 90% threshold, you decrease the economic growth by one full percentage point. Yeah, and, and, and what you have to do, number one, stop spending. I would say cap spending at where it is now. Cap spending. Okay. And then you start reducing over time. But stop the, the, the extra spending right now. Are you saying you're against, against raising taxes? Well, look, realistically, you've got to have a combination of, of decreased spending and, and some taxes, yeah. You want raising taxes? Uh, revenue should be on the table only in the discussion of the long-term unfunded liabilities for Social Security and Medicare. You have to have an honest conversation where every option is on board, and then you decide which one is better than the other. But the, the real solution to the problem is economic growth. Absolutely. That, that's where I was hoping you were going to go, because I'm, I'm pretty much against grow raising taxes. Economy, if you grow the economy, increases. you get more revenue. And last question, I only have a couple of seconds left, is how do we, wh what do we do about black unemployment? Now, black unemployment has always been like twice as much sure. as, as, as regular unemployment. Um, what do we do about that? Is, is that? is it one of those things about more African Americans, you know, uh, starting their own businesses and, and hiring some of their own? Or, you know, what is, what is it? Because we, we've been dealing with this for, for quite some time, regardless of who's president, right. who's in the White House. Dr. Wallace, the same percentage of businesses that did not have more than one employee in black America is exactly what it was 100 years ago. So the problem is not necessarily starting new businesses, it's growing them. And that happens through policies like what I refer to. Okay. If you allow entrepreneurs to build up capital from um, capital gains, dividends, and interest income, those businesses can hire more employees and then we can grow. Quickly. 20 seconds. Uh, the problem is, uh, of all blacks with college degrees, 60 percent work in local, state, and federal government. Of the remaining 40 percent, uh, um, 65 percent of those work in corporate America, leaving you basically 25, 35 percent for entrepreneurship. We have a massive brain drain in the black community and no one's addressing that. Well, great discussion. I wish we had more time. Thank you, Thank you for being here. There's, there's plenty more we could, we, we could talk about on this issue. Hopefully next time I'll be able to invite you guys back and we'll talk some more. We'll be back in just a moment.
Welcome to Freedom's Journal Magazine TV. Today we're going to talk about genocide in the black community through abortion. Did you know that abortion is the number one killer of African Americans? Today with us we have the Reverend Dean Nelson. He's the Vice President of Underserved Outreach at CareNet and, one, and the founding member of the Black Pro-Life Coalition. Thank you, Dean. It's a pleasure to have you here. Great to be here. Thanks, Dr. Wallace. So share with us what's happening uh, in the Black Pro-Life Movement, if you will. Sure. Well, as you know, this is uh, approaching the 40th anniversary of, uh, of Roe v. Wade. And I think a lot of those in the pro-life community and in America are asking the question, you know, what gains have been made, you know, over the last 40 years? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that is at least encouraging is that there's a, a growing movement of minority leaders, particularly black leaders, who have really taken a hold of this issue and begun to own it. Because many of us believe that with the high rates of abortion within the black community, that this issue really won't, uh, won't be changed unless there are more vocal African American leaders who rise to the forefront. What are the numbers? Wow, uh, staggering. Um, since Roe v. Wade, the conservative estimates are 15 million uh, abortions wow. within the black community, over 50 million uh, you know, in, in America alone. Some estimates put that maybe at 18 million in the black community. Uh, sadly, uh, you'll actually see in the African American community, um, the abortion is the, you know, the leading cause of death, as you pointed out, more than AIDS, more than cancer, more than heart disease, all of those things combined. Uh, abortion is the leading cause of death with almost 500,000 uh, innocent lives lost every year. And there are still a lot of people, black and white, who simply don't realize the numbers. In fact, in places like New York City, uh, abortions outnumber live births in the black community, almost 60% in New York City alone. And a lot of other cities like Washington, D.C., Detroit, and others have uh, numbers that almost rival that of New York City. Now, I know we've, we've talked about this before, that there seems to be, um, it seems as though the black community doesn't seem to be aware of some of these, or if they're aware, it's like there's um, a malaise or, you know, like the black preacher, there's been some question that they don't seem to uh, get as excited about this issue as they do, like, maybe the same-sex marriage issue. Um, why is that, and what do you think we can do to, to change that? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, there's some reasons, you know, perhaps that, you know, the black community is not as vocal uh, about traditional, you know, about abortion as they are about traditional marriage. But I think um, what we're trying to do is to, to educate uh, those in our communities because they simply don't know. You know, because of the problem with out of wedlock, you know, births, uh, you know, since, you know, some of the liberal experiments, you know, in the past, I think the average person looks in their community and they see, uh, you know, children that are, you know, that don't have mothers and fathers, they tend to think, well, you know, we're, we're having our babies. But the reality is, is that, you know, the average, you know, black woman, you know, growing up, you know, in the urban community mm -hmm. uh, is often even in their school system uh, <laughs> barraged with, uh, you know, information uh, regarding um, abortion and contraception at a very early age. And so what we find is a lot of these women actually have babies, but they also have multiple mm -hmm. abortions. Now, I want to eventually get to uh, get you to talk a little bit about what CareNet is doing, but before we get there, what do you do with, with, with the people who say, well, you know, we have a lot of um, uh, illegitimate births in the black community, so isn't it better to, you know, if these are unwanted pregnancies, to, to abort these babies? Um, because, you know, where are they, where are they going to go if, if we've got, I think it was like 70% um, uh, out, of wed, out of wedlock births? Um, so what, how do you answer that question? Sure, sure. Well, I think that the key thing is, is number one, fundamentally, is affirming the right to life. I don't think mm -hmm. that there's any excuse, and, black, and it bears out in the polls, most African Americans consider themselves pro-life. Pro um, but I think that we need to say unequivocally that, you know, uh, abortion stops a beating heart. Uh, abortion snuffs out the life of an innocent human being. And so there are studies that even suggest that one, even from uh, George Mason University, that though abortion is being used as a form of contraception. So actually, when you have abortion laws that are more restrictive, what you actually see is that um, they don't have as many uh, out of wedlock births. So there are a lot of problems that we need to, need to address, but I think fundamentally, we need to say to our community that every life is precious and we need to, uh, to fight this battle uh, not on the front of using uh, abortion as birth control. Right, right. Okay, so tell us a little bit about 
what you're doing at CareNet, and your position is the Vice President of um, Underserved Outreach. Sure. Uh, and how you guys are making a difference. Thanks, I appreciate that. When we say underserved, that's simply our areas where abortion rates are high and uh, resources are scarce. And so what CareNet has done is the largest uh, pregnancy center uh, umbrella in the nation, over 1,150 pregnancy centers around, uh, around the country. Our goal is to establish these centers that provide free services, sometimes counseling, uh, ultrasounds, um, material assistance to uh, those women who feel like that they don't have any other option. And uh, the stories are extremely powerful, um, whether they are a woman that comes into one of our centers, uh, for those who are in the faith community, they love hearing about CareNet that also provides the gospel uh, and shares the gospel of Jesus Christ with these women because their goal is not just saving the baby but also uh, serving and saving uh, that mother's life as well. And so what we do in the urban initiative uh, in an underserved department is to plant more of these uh, life-saving centers in urban communities. And so just like, just like Planned Parenthood uh, uh, put more... Uh, Abortion mill there you go. in the black neighborhoods. Except, You're the going into the neighborhood. except the difference for us is we're not charging them. We're not you know motivating them to get an abortion and charging right. them four hundred or a thousand dollars. We're providing free services to women within these communities, and so uh, they're just really positive examples of where women can come in uh, and get you know uh, food assistance. They can get connections to uh, to jobs within the community. They can get material assistance, they can get counseling, and most of all, even through some of our um, a toll-free number and uh, online services that we have, um, they can, in very private, confidential setting, um, get counsel that they need to make a healthy decision. With, with a few seconds remaining, how would people who are watching this program right now get involved? What, what would you ask them to do um, uh, to, to, to help with what you guys are, the work you guys are doing at, at CareNet? and uh, for the Black uh, Pro-Life Coalition? Sure, first and foremost is, is, is education. Um, go to you know, blackandprolife.org uh, uh, or carenetturban.org to find out the real information. These aren't statistics that we've made up. These are vital statistics. Um, these are from the Census Bureau. Uh, but then beyond that, to become engaged. Um, we have people that are now serving on boards and pregnancy centers. We have new centers, one that we're just opening up in Richmond, Virginia, another one that we recently opened up in Detroit, Michigan, um, and be supportive of these pregnancy centers. And if there's a woman that they may know who is wrestling with this decision, we would encourage them to, uh, you know, to either go online to, um, you know, carenet.org mm -hmm. uh, or even to call. There's a toll-free number that they can call where they can get uh, assistance as well. And if I can give you that toll-free number is 1-800-395-HELP. Uh, I want to appreciate your being here and enlightening us on this issue. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is a very important issue. There's no telling how many Barack Obamas or Dr. Martin Luther Kings have been aborted with those millions of, of uh, babies that, have, that, that are gone. Um, it has been said that a mind is a terrible thing to waste, but I think aborting a baby is a terrible thing to do and a terrible life wasted. Thank you. We'll be back. Welcome to Freedom's Journal Magazine TV. In this segment, we'll be talking about voter ID. Black liberals are crying racism regarding the voter ID initiatives in various states. Is this black voter suppression, or is there a real reason to make it harder for dead people to vote? With me today, our guests in the studio are Horace Cooper. He's a research fellow at the National Center for Public Policy Research, a senior fellow with the Heartland Institute, and a director of law and regulation at the Institute for Liberty. We also have Sherilyn Harley Laban, co-chair of Project 21 National Advisory Board, and she's a former senior counsel for the United States Senate Judiciary Committee. Thank you very much for being here. I'm hoping you can enlighten us on this topic. Well, you know, this has interested me for quite some time. Um, the, the argument that's being put forward by progressives, the arguments that are being put forward by many people who claim they represent the interests of blacks, contravenes the very history of uh, voter suppression and the importance of protecting the right of everyone's vote to count. It has always been the case that we've been concerned about the legitimate 
uh, citizens in a given community having the right to influence the outcome of the elections. Whether you block them with Klansmen uh, helmets or suits on, or whether you do it by sleight of hand with the absentee ballot, or by impersonating them, or having convicts, or illegals vote in their stead, the same outcome occurs. And that is a legitimate portion of the population isn't allowed to have its rights expressed. And let me add to what Horace has said. It's very interesting um, the arguments that the liberals have raised and when you look at the facts. The facts are when Indiana passed its law, its voter ID law, Justice John Paul Stevens, and we would not by any stretch call him conservative, right. he said in a Supreme Court decision that the plaintiffs have failed to make the case that this voter ID law is going to be a hindrance or an impediment to anyone voting. And I might add, when the state of Georgia passed their voter ID law, we saw, in effect, the opposite of what the liberals and civil rights organizations allege. In the state of Georgia, we saw black voter participation increase yeah, I heard it after of decrease the then, right? state of Georgia passed their voter ID law. These two examples are in direct conflict with what people like Hillary Shelton of the NAACP argue, the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, ACLU, League of Voters, all of these groups allege that voter ID is going to be an impediment for people to go out and vote, minorities in particular, elderly, and that has just not been the case nor does the evidence indicate that. And you know what, one other thing that happened in Georgia and what we're seeing when these laws go into effect, not only are you getting higher um, minority turnout, you're seeing greater diversity of vote in minority turnout. And there may be a reason for that. One of the things that we've been doing at the National Center is looking at the actual conviction and arrest, rec arrest and conviction records of those engaged in voter fraud. Uh, typically, it is minorities who are targeted for voter fraud. Absolutely. Just as if you're going to steal money from people, you go to where the money is. If you're going to steal votes from people, you go to where people you think you can get away from. Now, is this, now is this bipartisan? Do we, do we, well, we as it turns out, it's not bipartisan. Yes, <laughs> no, not. there are few Republicans that engage in this, but it's almost a seven to one conviction rate between Democrats and Republicans. The, and they are targeting the least among us. They're going to people in public housing. They're actually recruiting people who are recently released out of prison, even though those people may not have been legally allowed to vote. And in the case of Virginia, a huge imbroglio occurred in which recently released convicts were tricked into voting in the primary, influencing the outcome of the election, displacing, in, in the city of Richmond, other black voters. But when they got caught, they were almost all sent back to jail. The people that engaged in the scheme to trick them, oh, they had all kinds of arguments that they could make that allowed them to be immune from prosecution. Now, is, this, is this the same um, group? I know there's some folks who were paid to go back and vote. Um, I think it had something to do with ACORN, I believe, that people were right. going and voting and getting paid to vote and go back and vote more than once. Is that some of what you're talking about that takes well, place? Well, the ACORN scheme, that was a couple years ago. The progressives mm -hmm. have reorganized. They're no longer wearing the umbrella of ACORN. However, they're using, it is, they're still very much techniques. doing the same techniques. They've just, they're doing it by another name. That's exactly right. And unfortunately, they're picking on minorities as Absolutely. the place to go. Now, in the state of New York and Troy, there was a recent um, trial in which city council member, a city clerk, other people in, in the high Democrat political offices said they wanted to make sure that the people who were in public housing were casting their vote the right way, but they couldn't trust them to do it, so they it's stole the vote for them. So they're voting for them, okay. And let me give you another example. In Mississippi last summer, Lasadella Sowers, who was, in fact, an NAACP official, she was convicted of 11 counts of voter fraud. Can you just imagine an actual NAACP official was convicted of 11 counts of voter fraud? Her very same group is making all of these allegations, yet one of their own was mm. convicted, 11 counts. Um, 
it was seven individuals were alive, but she was voting in their name, and four individuals were deceased, and she was voting as under the deceased names. Well, how are prosecutions going right now uh, to, to try and clean some of this up? Well, here's one of the things that the left uh, and progressives and even so-called representatives of, of black Americans have been claiming. Oh, voter fraud isn't a big deal. It's not happening. What we did recently was do an analysis. Let's compare the number of prosecutions for voter fraud with other types of criminal behavior. And we found out how about kidnapping in America. Kidnapping in which family members aren't involved. It's a person sends you a stranger. ransom note, a stranger. We found out that there are more kidnapping prosecutions happening, excuse me, there are fewer kidnapping prosecutions happening in America per state than there are voter fraud prosecutions. How about income tax fraud? We found that there are fewer income tax fraud prosecutions happening than there are voter election frauds. We also um, looked at insider trading. We found that there are fewer per state insider trading. Now, if we're going to look at the standard and say, if you only have, and we're looking at about six to seven mm -hmm. um, voter fraud uh, per state uh, per year, if you're going to say that that means it's insufficient. Yeah, six to seven percent. Six to seven actual prosecutions no, six, per seven state prosecutions. per year. If you say that that's too low and therefore it's not a big deal, then let's look at kidnapping, let's look at insider trading, let's look at income tax prosecutions. If the okay. standard is that number's too low, then we might want to remove these things as well. But as you know, these are serious problems, and the reason we think voter prosecutions aren't higher is it's much harder to find. Are you exactly. going to place police officers at every polling site? It, and that's the seconds. problem. It, it's much harder to prove. You need to gather evidence. And I might add, we don't exactly have an attorney general who is, um, let's aggressive. say, aggressive or enthused about doing these type of prosecutions. And obviously, he's very busy with Fast and Furious, which he still hasn't accounted for that. Right. Um, I don't know how busy he was that he couldn't um, prosecute the Black Pan new Black Panther Party for voter intimidation. He took a pass on that as well. One more question. We're, we're, we're basically out of time. <laughs> You're telling me in my ear. But I do want to... I do want to know what is driving this. What is what is what is driving it's a fear tactic. Hope? It's a, a fear tactic used to say, look, our campaign hasn't promised you anything real, so we're going to scare you. We have nothing to offer you but fear itself. That's right. I might add, this is a campaign of fear and smear because this administration has no record, no message, and no plan. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's the end of our time. We could go on thank with you for this. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much. My Next pleasure, time, Dr. We'll Wallace. Again. Thank you. We'll be back in just a moment. With the historical election of the first black president, one might reasonably imagine that the politics of racial grievance would by now be a thing of the past. But think again. The tactic of race baiting and fear mongering which have been around for years, don't appear to be going away anytime soon, especially if you count the fiery rhetoric of the Congressional Black Caucus's members as any indication. First, let me define the politics of racial grievance by quoting one of the first to both identify and articulate it for what it really is. He said, and I quote, there is a class of colored people who make a business of keeping the troubles, the wrongs, and the hardships of the Negro race before the public. Having learned that they are able to make the living out of their troubles, they have grown into the settled habit of advertising their wrongs, partly because they want sympathy and partly because it pays. Some of these people do not want the Negro to lose his grievances because they do not want to lose their jobs. This is a quote from Booker T. Washington in the early 20th century. As early as the 1900s, some blacks were using the grievances of the black community not to improve their plight, but to make a living propagating and agitating discontent among the masses. Today we call these race hustlers. The goal is to discourage black people from using their minds to think for themselves. The strategy employed by the race baiter, or the race hustler, is to rehearse the atrocities of the past, thus stirring and igniting the emotions. And once the emotions are stirred up, there is little critical thinking or discernment about real issues. You see, facts don't matter when people are emotional. The voter ID, as we noted, is a case in point. When black leaders are unable to debate the merit of their ideas or that of the president, they race bait or play the race card. If we stuck to the issues at hand, the CBC and the Obama administration would have to explain why the black unemployment is over 14% under President Obama, while it was only 9% under Bush. 
And as a matter of fact, Bush's unemployment rate for blacks was lower than Clinton's at 10%. But let's not be confused by the facts. It is easier to call people racist than to argue for more government when the government is in heavy debt and the programs you've been pushing are not working, especially for your black constituents. Yeah, tell them it's the Republicans' fault. The politics of racial grievance has been devastating to the black community. We are leading in all areas of social maladies. We lead in crime, dropout rates, abortion, imprisonment, illegitimacy, and the list goes on. So someone please tell me, what is the black community getting from the CBC and the first black president besides the race card? You can't buy food with it. You can't buy a house. It won't get you a job. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I say it is time to stop the insanity and call on the president and the CBC to stop the rhetoric and lay out a plan so that we can argue the merits of the plan and not play racial politics. The black community deserves better. America deserves better.